Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Buckeye Weekly Podcast. I am Tony Gerdeman, here as always with Tom Moore as my cat sneezes in the background. Tom, how's it going? All right. Maybe your cat's allergic to cats. I am. Oh, yes. We all are, but my wife wanted a cat, so I had to uh, learn to take medicine. And <laughs> now we're happy. <laughs> one one more creature in your house who hates you. That definitely seems like a good trade-off. <laughs> Yes, uh, it is good to get the evil stare every now and again from both of them. Uh, so, Tom, you doing all right? Yeah, I don't have any cats in my house, so I'm great. You know, we did some banter in the last show. I, you know, I don't really feel the need to banter this show. Nothing much has changed. Um, are you getting out and about now with the, the fact that we are allowed to get out and about? And are you retail or are you retailing at all? I have not retailed a whole lot. It's it's been. Uh, I went to Costco last week. That was uh, thrilling. I had not been to Columbus in like a month and a half. So that was that was big excitement. Still still there. In case you haven't been there, that was exciting. But uh, yeah, other than that, no. A lot of a lot of uh, going for runs, going for walks with my kids. That's uh, that's about it. I, I I saw I heard tell of a picture maybe from a news chopper. Hovering over Polaris, but it seems as though there are uh, quite a few people out today getting their shopping in uh, because they have not been able to do that for a while. And so everybody just continue to stay safe, uh, socially distance yourself from others. Uh, speaking of socially distant or social distancing, uh, last week in one of our listener question episodes, the question was asked, what if JT was stopped short? And uh, I don't know if that's really being social distancing, but uh, I'm trying here, Tom. But what, they asked, you know, what would have happened or what if, if JT would have been stopped short? You know, what what would have been the ramifications for Ohio State Michigan? And I, I think our answer was then that it, really nothing much would have changed for Michigan. And that, that was really the only aspect I looked at it um, from because – you know, the next year they still have injuries at quarterback and that still doomed them. They still lose a bunch of games. I don't think the, my thought was, I don't think the win would have kept Wilton Spate's shoulder from collapsing or whatever the following year or from having to play John O'Corn the following year and all, all of that stuff. What I don't know that we really did much of, and that's from the feedback that I got from people, is how this would have affected Ohio State, who then wouldn't have been shut out in the the Fiesta Bowl and there would have been no statement from Urban Meyer that this is never going to happen again. And maybe the thought was that there would be no Kevin Wilson and Ryan Day to follow. And I, you know, I, I don't know that I agree with that. I still think something would have happened because it was clear that the two seasons, you know, 2015, the offense was bad, but you understood giving everybody another chance because it was it was just one year, and you know you work out the kinks throughout the year, and they they got duped a little bit by that bowl game and figured 2016 would be great. And you know what, 2016, Tom, they ended up still going to the playoffs. But say that Michigan wins and they don't go to the playoffs, and, and again, they they play in a good bowl game and they dupe somebody. I, I don't know that Warner and Beck would have been coming back anyway. Where are you on that? You know, it it's an interesting question. Um, that offense, at the end of the year, it really did tail off quite a bit. They They went through, like, you remember that season, and if you think about it, you think, oh, you know, oh, they just absolutely destroyed Oklahoma, and... Um, you know they they had those back to back sixty two to three games against Nebraska and Maryland, and like in your head it's like oh this was just an incredibly dominating team, and then you look and it's like oh you know they did lose at Penn State, uh twenty one twenty four to twenty one and they did you know barely squeak one out at Wisconsin, they beat Northwestern an unranked Northwestern twenty four to twenty, they won at Michigan State seventeen to sixteen. It you know yes they scored thirty points against Michigan but it took double overtime you know there was just 
there was a lot at that end of that season. Like outside of the Nebraska and Maryland games, the, basically everything after September was like, yeah, it wasn't great. Like it really was not wonderful. And, you know, if they if they lose to Michigan, they probably switch sp- spots with Michigan and they're playing in the Orange Bowl against um, Florida State. And that Florida State team was fine, but it wasn't amazing. But, you know, you look at the you look at where Ohio State ended up on uh, in the S&P plus rankings from that year and they were 32nd in the nation in, on offense, 110th in isolated points per uh, points per play, which is like basically explosiveness. So it was like it was an offense that was loaded with talent and just was just kind of a little bit of a wet fart on the whole during the course of the year. You know, they ran the ball while they were second in rushing S&P plus, but passing 69th in the country and uh, passing down 72nd in the country. Like it just it was like if they if they had to throw the ball, then they, there was just nothing there. They just couldn't do it. And, you know, that that's something that. Would that have been enough to push Urban Meyer to make a change if they had just, you know, if they had like lost to Penn, to Florida State in that Orange Bowl? Maybe. I mean, it was the offense was pretty uninspired from a lot of 2015 and 2016. So I, I don't think it's it's an absolute slam dunk that those get guys get fired if if they just, you know, they lose the Orange Bowl to Florida State 28 to 24 or something like that. You know, is that enough? Like, eh, maybe. But, you know, it, it, it just, it, I definitely don't think you could say, yeah, those guys would definitely have been back if, even if they had been, if JT had been stopped short. And we know Urban keeps a running list of future assistant coaches or assistant coaches that he is paying attention to. And we know he liked Ryan Day, had a, uh, try to hire him previously. So this was a guy that he is watching. He knew Kevin Wilson, obviously. Um, when that guy becomes available, you, that's that's one you, you take a look at and you're like, well, you know what? He could do much better um, with, with Ohio State than what was going on. And as you mentioned, you look at those scores and, you, and it's, it's not pretty. And now try to imagine that team without Curtis Samuel. And which was going to be the 2017 season, and it was going to be even worse. And from some of the horror stories that you hear about uh, the offense under Warner and what it was like, I'm, I'm sure Urban was probably at his wit's end at that point. Like I said, it was, it was just kind of the perfect storm. Ed Warner was the co-offensive coordinator under Tom Herman, so he was the next man up. He had kind of earned it. And so Tom Herman leaves. You bring in Ed Warner. That first reason that first season is is rocky. You've got a two quarterback system. You know that can interfere with everything. And so Cardale leaves for the NFL and you're thinking, okay, now 2016 everything's gonna be fine. We've got everything going. Everybody knows what they're supposed to do. Everybody is comfortable. Tim Beck, you know, for weeks and weeks during the 2015 season, you know, well, I'm still trying to learn things and it's all, it's a learning process for me. And it took him longer than it should have to get uh, up to speed with, with what was going on. And so then 2016, everything was supposed to be fine. Everything was supposed to be working at its peak. And, you know, it, it looked fine for a while until it didn't. I mean, that Oklahoma game was, you know, that was, Ohio State was clearly a playoff team at that point. JT Barrett was great. But, Tom, we watched the 2016 Michigan game twice in the last month, and you saw how ungood that passing game was by that point. And, and, and JT was part of that reason because it was, you know, he's not Dwayne Haskins. He's not Justin Fields. Um, but I, I, I still feel like there would have been a change being made because that's – when you're Urban Meyer, unless you've completely settled, which he hadn't, you know, I, I think he makes a change regardless. Now, the question, some of the, the speculation that and feedback that we got was that if if he doesn't bring in Ryan Day, then what happens? Does he still step down after this past, after the 2018 season? And... You know, I I don't know that he steps down if um, if Day is here and they lose to Michigan in 2018, and I'm not sure he knows that 
what he knew was that it was a good time to hand off to a guy that he was confident in. Now, we know he was in pain and, and all that. And if he doesn't have Ryan Day, does he does he go through it for another season? Do they go out and get somebody he is comfortable with, like maybe Luke Fickle? Um, you know, that's that's some further speculation. And right now, Tom, it would seem lesser if Ohio State would be under Luke Fickle's watch than Brian Day. But I, I guess I guess the possibility is there had uh, JT Barrett been stopped short. Yeah, I mean, it's it's certainly a possibility. You, you, I mean, you, we're like four maybes down the chain. Like maybe he doesn't fire <laughs> them or maybe he does. And if he does, you know, if he doesn't, then maybe he, you know, decides not to retire. And then maybe they hire Luke Fickle instead of, someone else from the current staff, you know, you could, you could say, you know, if the, if the 2018 defense had been remotely competent, you could be talking about Greg Schiano as the head coach of Ohio state, mm-hmm. um, you know, or Alex Grinch as the head coach Alex of Ohio Grinch. state. If you wanted to go the, you know, the younger assistant kind of route the way that they did. So yeah, there, there's a whole bunch of, there's a whole bunch of maybes that, you know, you, you can get to the end of that and end up a whole different, a whole, a whole lot of different places, but you know, I, I'm I'm with you. I think that I think that the the offense was bad enough that you probably would have seen some kind of a change. And you know, it certainly seems like Kevin Wilson being newly available mm-hmm. would probably have been right at the top of his list. And you know, if if Tim Beck is being demoted from offensive coordinator, maybe Tim Beck doesn't want to be demoted from offensive coordinator, and so then maybe he leaves, and then the quarterback coaching position is open, and Ryan Day comes in anyway. Because I mean, Ryan Day was on Urban Meyer's list, and then you know, you and then you get there anyway. I, I think that I, I still think that's probably the most likely of the you know that chain of decisions is is you you end up there anyway, especially if they lose that Orange Bowl to Florida State. But you know, I mean, it's. You could you could go a, a number of different directions um, depending on where, you know, what which of those choices you you think is most likely. Yeah, even with a sixty-two to three win over a, like a Florida State or whatever in a bowl game, even with another sixty-two to three win, I still think Kevin Wilson being out there is something that Urban Meyer pulls the trigger on, and then if Warner is gone who at that point was just the tight ends coach does Tim Beck leave with them and I I, I just I think uh, it was going to happen what happened I think was going to happen regardless of that 31 nothing win and Urban it was it was clearly it was not a one game decision let's just let's just put it at that it was it was an entire season's worth of frustration even though it, the frustration was only in a handful of games so yeah I think we are we are correct, Tom. It was going to happen anyway, and um, you know now Ohio State's doing pretty good. They got this Ryan Day guy, uh, but Michigan, Tom, Michigan, uh, this week or this over the last few days, a few days ago, a week ago, again, time has no meaning. Jim Harbaugh wrote an open letter to whoever wanted to read it, basically detailing how he could. Uh, fix college football and it is interesting to me that i don't believe he's had any media availabilities maybe since the spring if he's even had any then but if you want to say if you want to talk or you know get some thoughts out there you you can do it to the media you can say hey you know like everybody's doing press conferences or teleconferences things like that, get some information out about your team, but then also put what you want out there. But instead, of course, he is just writing an open letter, answering no questions. But then I did see he went on, it's John Jansen's podcast, former Michigan offensive lineman, who whose podcast is on the Michigan MGO Blues website. So again, he is answering basically uh, university employees' questions about his open letter. So really not talking to the the media at this point, but his open letter basically let's let's uh, let's fix college football. These are what I these are uh, my things that I want, and the number one thing on there was players should be able to declare for the NFL 
whatever they want, not being three years removed, being one year removed, whatever. And I, Tom, I don't think anybody saw this as anything other than it sure would be nice if Ohio State had less talent on their roster. And I'm not just talking about people from an Ohio State perspective. Uh, this feels like he's championing championing the players and their and their rights to leave whenever they want. But even even national guys could see or, or were saying that, boy, this year feels like a situation where you know it would just be nicer if Ohio State didn't have as much talent. That would make these whole these games a whole heck of a lot easier. Right. I mean, it's it's very easy to say, you know, hey, Justin Fields, wouldn't it be great if Justin Fields wasn't playing in 2020? Wouldn't it have been great if, <laughs> J- if Chase Young wasn't playing in 2019? Like, yeah, when you don't have guys who are likely to be in that group, like, yeah, of course. The big issue there is that's a that's an NFL rule. If the NFL was letting players come after one year of uh, college football, then Sure, then they could do that, but that's an NFL rule that you have to be three years out of high school. So Jim Harbaugh doesn't – I mean like Jim Harbaugh wouldn't have much say over the NCAA changing a rule, but Jim Harbaugh has no say over the NFL changing a rule. So, And and I don't know that that's something the NFL wants to outsource anyway because think about how much development it takes for a player to be ready for uh, – to be a college starter in most cases – at, at, you know, like the Ohio State level or the Alabama level or the Georgia level or Clemson level. That's not something that most guys are doing as true freshmen. And then even those guys have a jump up to the NFL. So this is that this allows the existing model allows the NFL to outsource a lot of its player development to college. Let them build up their strength, get faster, get stronger, build up their their football IQ, all of that and do it under the uh, you know, under the umbrella of college, let these guys build up their names a little bit so that they're a bigger deal when you pick them. Let these guys, you know, develop, do outsource all of that development so the NFL doesn't have to have like a D league. And, you know, it, it makes perfect sense for the NFL to do that. And then you get more film on these guys and you can make smarter draft picks. All of the existing system makes sense for the NFL, which is why I don't think there's any realistic way it's actually going to change. It, to me, this is like a college basketball coach, like Jim O'Brien, who never wanted to go after the one and dones or those elite prospects saying, yeah, they should be allowed to go to the NBA straight away because I'm not going to go after them. And so I'd rather just have nobody go after them. That makes my life easier. And this would make his life easier. And it's funny that Long before this, we've talked about his lack of energy and how listless he seems and the lack of energy when it comes to recruiting and how that needs to change if Michigan is going to advance up the, the social structure and being becoming a national title contender until he is the elite recruiter, energetic guy that um, – that he used to be, and I'm not saying he was an elite recruiter, just that he was an energ- energetic guy before when he first started. Let's not forget the satellite camps, the sleepovers, that sort of thing. Those days are gone for him, and now he's just like, you know what? Nobody should do that stuff. Recruiting should take place at home. The elite players should be allowed to go whenever because, you know what? They're not coming here, so I don't want to deal with them. I don't want to play them. It's like kind of like when Woody would... If he knew he wasn't getting the guy, he would try to send him to Notre Dame so he wouldn't have to face him anymore. And this is just Jim Harbaugh trying to send people to the NFL. Uh, maybe he should work on sending his own players to the NFL rather than Ohio State's players. <laughs> maybe that would be a, an area of focus where he could could take part and improve. Uh, but it, it's, I don't know, maybe we're being a, a little too cynical. Uh, I, just, I don't think so. No, I mean, I it just it just seems like uh, I mean the the Latin phrase you're looking for is qui bono, which is who benefits, and that's sort of the question that you ask whenever uh, whenever anyone proposes something new. It's like, okay, well, who would benefit from this? Why does why is this person proposing this? And you know, sure, maybe it's maybe it's players uh, players' rights, but it seems like it would benefit other people's players' rights much more than his own players. So that that's that's sort of. Uh, 
sort of, I think, tells you where where the motivation may really be coming from. And, you know, the, the rest of it was like, it was like interesting because he said if it was not, if players were not taken in the first 224 picks or not signed, they should be able to return to college. So, you know, if you're not taking the top 224 picks, that's basically the whole draft. You know, I right. think that it's number that number rounds. can vary a yeah. little bit based on the season, but that yeah. puts you in the seventh round. So if you're not picked in the first seven rounds, you should be able to return. Like, I, I think there are probably guys who, if they were picked in the third round, might want to return. And that that's, uh, you know, the, again, like it's it's just – it's it the whole thing read very much like a I'm going to get some positive PR here, and I don't think anything's actually going to come of it. Well, and if you are going to allow players to return, your scholarship limits have to go from 85 to about 100, you know, there or 95, because if you've got guys returning that you have filled their roster spot, uh, now you've got an issue. And the thing is, like. If you give guys 95 spots, they're going to fill them with recruits and there's still not going to be room for those guys to come back because that's what coaches do. And, and you can't you can't just think, well, maybe this guy will come back because you don't know what he will and you have to prepare for him not to. So you're going to give his spot up. Now, can there be 85 scholarship spots and then 10 spots for existing players who might choose to come back? Maybe you do it that way. And I don't even hate the idea uh, – but, uh, you know, the idea that if you give players the opportunity to leave before they're ready, a lot of them will take it. And you see the damage that it did to the NBA where you've got a lot of guys that were just drafted on their potential. And if they could have gotten more seasoning, they would have been more successful themselves. And the physicality in the NFL is much greater than the NBA, except for, you know, during the the late 80s and early 90s of the Detroit Pistons bad boys uh, who are still more physical than the Detroit Lions of today. But, you know, you you look at, you know, Tom, we've all seen these pictures that uh, seniors will, will tweet from, like, their arrival in their shorts and, and um, like, their first workout photo or whatever. And then after four, four years of these photos of their shorts tucked up and you know, shirtless, and then you just see the body mass grow over the four years a lot of these guys, you know, there's a reason they have five years to play for in college is because sometimes it takes those guys five years. And yeah, Adrian Peterson probably could have played as a freshman. That's one guy out of 280,000. That's just the number I just picked over the last, you know, 15 years, 20 years that uh, was ready. And so you don't, you don't create a role for the anomaly. And he was better off going to college for a little bit and learning. And that's, it's not about holding back somebody's rights. It's just about sometimes, you know, what's better for a teenager than a teenager, Tom. Yeah. I mean, this is the, I think it would be probably pretty dangerous. I would say for like the average 18 year old to try and play in an NFL game. I mean, that's just like the, when people are that much bigger than you, that much stronger than you, that much faster than you, like nothing good is going to happen to you if you're, if you're out on the field. And so then you're, you know, do you, are you spending two years just developing off the field anyway? And how many teams are going to have the patience to do all the off field work on the hopes that you can come out as well as you would, you know, as well as you would have if you had just played two more years of college football? Like, Maybe there's certain guys who there that would be worth doing it, you know, doing it for. But a lot of them, like I don't, I don't know how much, you know, is the NFL going to basically start a minor league for these guys or like a ta- you know, some kind of like JV games, almost like taxi squad games for these guys. I, I don't, I don't know how this is supposed to work from the NFL's perspective. But you know, like I said, it just nothing about this from the NFL's perspective makes a whole lot of sense outside of, like you said, like, like the really, really, rare, really, truly rare exceptions. I don't know who, how many guys the NFL would think, yeah, this would have been great if we had only been able to get our hands on, you know, these, these guys two years earlier, like absolutely we would have done it and it would have worked out great. But like, there's, I don't know, five of them, 10 of them, like it just, and then, and then you're putting, you're putting so many other players in a, in a spot where they're probably not going to come out as well. 
and that hurts ultimately hurts the NFL because you're you're taking away player development and you're you're ultimately not getting as many great players and then the NFL game isn't as good. So yeah, I just I don't see how this would make any sense for the NFL at all. I don't know that it makes sense for Michigan either. If you think of the this kind of idea, if his thinking is now, you know what, you know, I, I I'm just in this for the the idealized academic model and warrior poet type of thing. And you know, I'm tired of the the professionalization of these guys and the focus being on getting them to the NFL. And it's you know, the focus isn't on getting them to the NFL. The focus is on maximizing them. And if the NFL is the end result of that, that's great for the player because the NFL is a really good living where you can retire um, pretty young and still have a sizable bank account. But if he's to the point now where he's like, you know, I prefer – the the Ivy model or the I the this is something where the purity of it if if that's where he is now then it is it is time to get rid of him because that's not that's not the Big Ten the Big Ten is academic but it is also football and if he is bowing out of the football aspect then it is time for Michigan to go and get somebody else I mean if he's if he's uh, concerned about the professionalization of college football, I would like to point out that his uh, salary, I think a couple of years ago, was $7.5 million. <laughs> so, you know, if he has if he has Not problems him. with uh, people trying to make a living in football, I, I have some follow-up questions. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what – I don't know if he, I don't think he's gotten a contract extension and I think his other contract expired after the 2021 season. So I don't know, uh, I don't know what, uh, how much longer he's really thinking he's going to be at Michigan, but yeah, there's just, there's just a lot of, a lot of the stuff that he does. That's just like, what, what is he going for here? And I just I looked at his Twitter account while you were talking. I, I looked up his Twitter account to see like did has he tweeted this out? Has he provided any context on this? Uh, he has sent exactly one tweet since last year's uh, Ohio State Michigan game, and that was when Bump Elliott died in December. That's it. So, like I, I get the sense that this has stopped being fun for him, and you know I, I'm not I'm not sure how much longer he's uh, he's he's going to be doing what he's doing. You mentioned an extension, and I. I haven't really thought about that. I I don't expect an extension to happen. I mean, it, it's it's I I just don't see the energy there, and I you see you see so much misery, and you know why would why would you want more of that? Sure, he wants to beat Ohio State, uh, and more than anything, I'm sure. But you don't just do that in November, and that's that's why Ohio State wins, and Michigan doesn't because Ohio State doesn't just do it in November. They're doing it now, talking, to, texting recruits. They're doing it now, getting players to Michigan drills at home. You know, I don't know how they're doing it, but uh, you know, this this is an everyday thing. As Urban Meyer has said, as J- Jim Tressel has said, Brian Day continues to say, it's it's not uh, it's not once a year. It's it's every day. And you look at Jim Harbaugh's overall commitment to anything. I'm sure he's committed to his players. I don't know that he's committed to this game. And if you're not committed to the game, you're going to have some unhappy fans. Yeah. Harbaugh, Harbaugh is, uh, I, I'm just looking this up right now. I just, I just wanted to be sure I was right about this. Yeah. According to this, his car, heart contract is set to expire after 2021. And it says by J- uh, December 1st, 2020, according to the terms of his current agreement with Michigan, Harbaugh and the university, quote, will meet and indicate whether they have mutual interest in negotiating an extension. That deadline is is less than two years away. Think about how often college coaches get their contracts extended, you know, when the, anytime they dip below four years, it's like, well, I have to get my contract extended right now for recruiting purposes because we're going to get. You know, we're going to kids. Kids are going to see that and think, well, I, he's I'm not going to be here to coach them and they won't sign up. And th- there's been like nothing on this. And this has been there was an article in, I think, December from a, a newspaper in Michigan where this, the headline was the elephant in the room. Jim Harbaugh's contract like if this has been lingering that long and, you know, it's it's down to the point where he's only got two years left like that. That does seem pretty. uh I mean that that seems somewhat telling based on the typical uh business of college football and you know 
it would not be unrealistic for Michigan or unreasonable for Michigan to be looking at the fact that he's paying. He's supposed to make $8 million, by the way, for 2020. Uh, for Michigan to look at that and go, are we getting $8 million worth of value out of this man? And to decide the answer is no. Like that would be an entirely reasonable thing. And, you know, if they're not willing to give him that much money or they're not willing to give him a raise, it would not be surprising if Harbaugh was saying, well, fine, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not, I'm not taking a pay cut. I'm not taking less money. I'm not taking, uh, you know, a smaller buyout. And for that to be a sticking point and, and for him to just kind of say, screw it. But yeah, there's there's a lot up th- that's going on up there right now that just it doesn't look like a healthy, you know, program that's firing in all cylinders. And and the letter coming out when it did, the way it did was just kind of like you know, it, there it raises with when there are enough other questions going on, it's reasonable to look at that and kind of kind of look at it with a little bit of a jaundiced eye. Well, and you mentioned the recruiting aspect of it. Urban Meyer was being negatively recruited about his future. And so they announced in 2018, like that before the 2018 season, I think it was February, 2018, a two year contact contract extension throughout through, um, you know, to give like this, this four year window, because, you know, say Penn state, some, some were saying Penn state, who knows, you know, was it James Franklin that was negatively recruiting Ohio state and saying that urban Meyer wouldn't be there. You know, they, and was he right? Sure. Sure. Uh, but, uh, but you had to you had to answer those uh, answer those those accusations I guess you'd call them with with the contract extension to show yeah no I definitely have a future here and maybe it's because Boston College and, and uh, Temple don't negatively recruit against Michigan since that's seemingly who Michigan's recruiting against now uh, but yeah the fact that there is maybe there has been some negative recruiting about the future of Jim Harbaugh but or, or maybe it's like they don't. Teams don't need to play that card, you know, that we're, yeah, we don't need to negatively recruit Michigan. Uh, they're doing just fine on their own, Tom. <laughs> uh, Michigan's, one of the things that has really hurt Michigan in recruiting is the fact that their games are on TV and their results are uh, published online. That has been a real negative, I think, for that program. And I'm not, I'm not sure, frankly, how they fix that. Well, well, how they fixed it is uh, Jim Harbaugh's fourth proposal. Let's do away with cable. <laughs> Now I'm on board with that. That's fine with me. <laughs> the other, the, one of the other things, well, the, uh, of his proposals that would fix their fix college football would be to let students come back after they've been drafted or after their NFL careers, or if they've left and, and didn't get drafted, just allow them to finish their education. And I think he proposed it like, you know, if they leave two years early, uh, allow them to, or if they put in two years, or if they leave two years early, allow them to have two years. If they leave with one year remaining, allow them to have one year, some some kind of a math equation like that. But this is his proposal for all of college football. Mind you, Ohio State has been doing this for a long time. I think Jim Trussell implemented it for players who um, who leave early for the NFL can always come back and finish their degree. And it's, it's been a thing that has been at Ohio state for seemingly ever now. And I, and I tweeted it today. It doesn't need to be a rule. You just need to act on it. Just if, if Jim Harbaugh wants this Michigan, he should go to Michigan and say, let's do this. Let's make this happen. And you know, that's, it doesn't, you don't need Mark Emmert to step in. You don't need this grand resolution. Each university, if he wants it at Michigan, he should have enough sway or at least get that ball rolling to make it happen. Uh, it, it's, it's it's interesting to me that he sees this as an ideal. Uh, and Ohio State's been doing it for a long time. Uh, maybe I'm not going to say Ohio State is better than Michigan or has their students' interests at heart more than Michigan. I would never say that. But it's just funny, interesting to me that he wants this to happen and thinks it's a great idea and it's something that Ohio State has been doing forever. Well, I, I don't think it would be responsible to say that they have their best interests at heart. I think it just, you know, maybe it's reflective more of the fact that Ohio State takes academics more seriously than Michigan. Maybe maybe that's the takeaway there. That's that's a very true point, as evidenced by the uh, the implementation of online learning long ago. Mm. You know, let mm-hmm. allow students to learn how they can learn best and give them more options. And and now Michigan is playing catch up, online learning, football, all of it. And maybe one day, maybe one day they will finally catch up. We will see. 
Um, Tom, that's going to do it for this show. Uh, a Michigan heavy show, which we don't ever seem to mind. So that's good. Um, Jim Harbaugh giving us something to talk about. Yeah, listeners don't ever seem to mind us talking about the current state of Michigan football, which I can't I can't imagine why Ohio State fans would not mind us talking about the current state of Michigan football. Could could be anything. Could be they're not great. Could it could be anything. Who's to say? Who's to say? Maybe it's just good conversation. Uh, so we want to thank you all for listening. Uh, enjoy your malls out there this week, everybody. Uh, enjoy shopping. Say hi to everybody at the local Talbots. Is that a thing, Tom? <laughs> it it was at some point in like the 1980s. <laughs> I'm I, I, I'm probably not in the target demographic for Talbots, so I'm really not 100 percent sure. Tell everybody at Walden Books I said hello. Mm, there you um, go. That's yes. <laughs> I go to malls. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. We're, we're going to go ahead and, and call it a day. Everybody continue to stay safe out there. Yes, you can go run amok a little bit more, but just still, just keep your distance from me. I would appreciate it. Uh, everybody have a good week, a good rest of your day, and we will talk to you later. Good morning.